Hello and welcome to episode 75 of There Is No Oldie, There Is Only Goody, <laughs> the show where we only talk about good films. That's what we're doing. We've just had good film after good film after good film. Is it setting us up for a massive disappointment when we do a bad film? Maybe. But who knows? Maybe it's this week. Ooh. <laughs> Welcome to Oldie But A Goodie. Yeah, it's a show where we're like, what came out this week back in 1984? We pick one of the movies. We do a full synopsis review. So spoilers, if you haven't for some reason seen the film we're talking about this week, pause the episode, go check it out, come back if you want. My name's Sandro Felcher. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Zach Adams. Hello, I am here, yes. But we're also joined by someone else. The only person who could be on this episode, who could talk about Ghostbusters on this show, is Rob Lloyd. Hello. Hello, hello. It is a pleasure to be back on the exact same day, but a year later that I, that we recorded um, uh, my first appearance on Oldie But A Goodie. Is that right? Huh. Yeah, the Flintstones Yay. came out today, back in 1994, which is when we're recording this episode. There you go. Huh. There you go. Well, it, yeah, it was meant to be, meant to be. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. You were meant to be on our episode of Crackers. That didn't happen, but you did watch Crackers very quickly. What did you think? <laughs> oh my god, it was a piece of shit, wasn't it? Oh, <laughs> what a big piece of ass that movie was with an incredible cast, an amazing cast. And they go, right, okay, so this is what it looks like when an actor just takes a job because they need to pay the rent and the bills. Um, yep. mm. Yeah, nothing redeeming about that film whatsoever. Not even Christine Baranski uh, playing the playing the saucy, you know, uh, 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 80s bit who gets her clothing off most of the time could uh, could could save this disaster of a film. Wow. I would have, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry I missed the, uh, the, 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 um, the dissection that would have been talking about that film. Yeah, that was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't miss much. <laughs> it was us pretty much saying what you said, <laughs> but for in different hour. ways for like an hour. <laughs> yeah. And that, of course, got our cracked, more like just plain broken award, which is worse mm. than an oldie. Our only worse than an oldie rating for this year. Perhaps it's great then that you're on this episode of Ghostbusters. No spoilers, but this may be better than a goodie. Oh, uh, this yeah. This just may be. In my mind, I believe, yeah. It, 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 I think it transcends the definition of what a goodie is. But we, we don't want to pick too soon, gentlemen. I'm just curious. Sorry, one second. I just needed to know, Rob Lloyd, have you... Are you, a, are you a fan of Ghostbusters? Have you ever done anything Ghostbusters related, perhaps? Well, um, I may or may. Uh, anniversary of some sort of doing things related to Ghostbusters. <laughs> I need to know your credentials on this subject. Well, very true, very true. I'm glad you're so you're thorough when it comes to um, you know, vetting yeah. your, your guests on your show. As, as, <laughs> as you did with my expertise of the Flintstones when I um, appeared exactly. on that as well. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> you'll be happy to know that, you know, my expertise, which was highly regarded with uh, Flintstones, <laughs> it's even more so when it comes to uh, Ghostbusters. I may or may not have done a 30th anniversary show uh, uh, looking at um, Ghostbusters back in 2014, which kind of was the... the the springboard. I was only meant to do it as a one-off, and we did it on one night with me and David Innes as my support. But then it kind of springboard uh, uh, became this this uh, regular thing for David Innes and I. So then, f from 2014 onwards, every year we put on at least two or three one-off mm. specials to celebrate the anniversary of a TV show or a movie. And it all started with uh, uh, Spook Central, our 30th, my 30th anniversary Ghostbusters uh, special, and that was a lot of fun looking at all the the behind the scenes machinations i'm looking forward to talking about it um with you guys because we talked about it back in 2014 when you guys were on the uh, legitimate yeah. legitimate radio um yeah. in, in sunbury of course um because yeah. nothing's more legitimate than sunbury radio <laughs> nothing's more legitimate than a radio station that plays nothing but country music <laughs> 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 everyone's favorite genre yeah, you 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 were um, quite, you were you know scrubbing yourself clean with hand sanitizer and bleach long before this whole COVID nineteen <laughs> thing. Oh, we brought earplugs into the studio. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it'll be great to revisit it. You know, uh, six years later, but um, still talk about the the legacy and the impact of of uh, Ghostbusters. Yeah, definitely. All right. Um, from memory, Zach, I picked this one right. What were the other yes. options this week? Well, there was a few wee options. Uh, your other options were Beat Street. 
A young hip-hop artist aspires to make it big as a disc jockey. Hmm. It's a dance film, just like the other one we did. The other one was pretty good. Uh, And then we had uh, Top Secret, a parody of uh, Elvis Presley movies, as well as the spy films. And and, and World War Two films? It's a parody yeah. of a lot of films. It's a great film. It's an underrated classic because, you know, it came out at the same time. But it's got the Val Kilmer plays the lead. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, great film. So much fun. Yeah. Zucker Brothers from memory as well. It which is. all the jokes of visual gags, which would have made a great podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's um, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Yeah, I want to check it out. And finally, Gremlins, which, yeah. of course, as I mentioned, I'd seen, like, yet last year... Uh, which is another comedy horror with mischievous creatures who you shouldn't throw in bathtubs or mm. feed after midnight. Mm. I don't think you should throw any creature in a bathtub. That's just a mean thing hey, to look, do. Hey, look, if it needs a wash, yeah. you toss it in the bathtub. You <laughs> yeet that boy into a pool, you dip it into a bucket, you gotta wash that boy. <laughs> right. Make sure he ain't dirty. Yeah, fair enough. Probably in less violent ways. But Ghostbusters was released June 8th. It's directed by Ivan Reitman. We have done an Ivan Reitman film before, the one that came out in 1994, that being Junior, uh, went with mm. Schwarzenegger being pregnant. I can't remember. Did you rate that a goodie? I think I gave that an oldie. I can't remember. Uh, yeah, I think that's definitely how it went, because I rated <laughs> it a goodie. Possibly not because of how good the film itself was, but how good I found the film in me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like a pregnant man myself, I, I had this film as a little baby and I couldn't couldn't rate my little baby an oldie, could I? You gave birth to a positive review, the only positive review the junior has ever received. <laughs> Quite possibly. I think it got like three out of four from Roger Ebert at the time or something. Like it wasn't. Oh yeah, yeah. it's a goofy. It's great. Reitman, he's behind uh, stuff like Bill Murray's film debut, Meatballs. He's also made Kindergarten Cop, Twins, that sort of stuff. Uh, It's written by Dan Aykroyd, of course, of SNL and Blues Brothers fame. We did My Girl 2 from 94 as well, which he was in. And Howard Ramis who also worked on Reitman's previous film, Stripes. He's known Mm. for directing Caddyshack, National Lampoon's Vacation, uh, Groundhog Day in the 90s. They are also, of course, cast members playing Ray and Egon. Yes, absolute superstars. Yeah, just a Mm. pedigree of talent right there. Um, All of them at the height of their fame, like Bill Murray was an absolute you know, superstar, high in demand, moving from one project to the next. Uh, Ramis could could do no wrong. Um, uh, Aykroyd obviously was um, still riding high off his... uh, his stint on Saturday Night Live and, and Harold Ramis was mm. highly regarded for his, you know, starting out in Second City and as a, mm. you know, improv and sketch writer and, and uh, not so much as a performer, but, um, mm. but, uh, but yeah, his work on, on Stripes showed that he had a, 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 a definite screen presence, a, 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 an easy screen presence. And he just, mm. The, the film couldn't have been made without him. Yeah, it's hard to think of a time. Hard to think of a time because Ramus was brought um, was brought in quite late into the procedures. So it's hard to think of there was a time when Harold Ramus wasn't going to be connected with Ghostbusters. Probably going to mention it all throughout the episode, but the episode about Ghostbusters on the movies that made us on Netflix is great. If you want to know about how this film was made, it's such a good special. So good. Yeah. All those specials are great. Yeah. The toys that made us, the movies that made us are great. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, Bill Murray plays Peter, and then we've also got Ernie Hudson as Winston. Uh, he only really did a couple like smaller roles in a large variety of films before this, including one called Space Hunter Adventures in the Forbidden Zone from 1983, <laughs> which sounds amazing. We've, we've done quite a few films with him being in them before, both from 1994, that being Airheads and The Crow. Good to see him again. Yeah, it was sort of like uh, Ghostbusters was like his big break, and... Um... He's worked consistently ever since. He's never been like sort of like a uh, uh, above the titles name, but he's worked consistently. He's done some incredible work, like his work on The Hand of Rocks the Cradle. It's a schlocky film, but he's quite good in it. Um, he's work in Oz, the TV show Oz, groundbreaking TV show Oz in the in the uh, late nineties, early noughties. It was powerful. Uh, the Crow, obviously. So mm. yeah, he's sort of like that legitimate actor who um, has carried on a career in sort of like supporting roles and stuff like that. He's never been out of work, but he's never been a superstar, but he's always highly regarded. 
Sigourney Weaver is in this as well, playing Dana Barrett. At this <laughs> point, uh, she was most known for playing Ripley in Alien, of course, and <sighs> she used this movie as well as 83's Deal of the Century with Chevy Chase to kind of say, hey, I can be funny too. Can can I do some funny movies and not stuff where I've just got to like be in pain for an hour and a half? <laughs> and she's great. And of course... The only person who just makes me smile so much whenever I see him in anything, even if it's the Flintstones, uh, Rick Moranis, yeah. playing Lewis Tully. Such an early role for him. He had his breakout in 83 with Strange Brew, which he co-wrote <laughs> and co-directed. Uh, f- I, it seems like it's loosely based of Hamlet and is kind of focused around a couple characters made popular by the Second City sketch TV show. Yeah, the Mackenzie brothers from their 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 um their their, their Canadian brother characters. Yeah, which you've got to check out at some point. Um, and he was also in the alternative option from last week called Streets of Fire, which I think yes. Zach and I we've got to watch that at some point. It sounds great. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, Willem Dafoe's in that as well, and oh yeah, it's a yeah. Awesome, awesome eighties rock and roll sort of like, uh, um, yeah, gangland film. So what you're saying is it's an oldie, but a goodie. <laughs> <laughs> it does what it says on the tin. Perfect. <laughs> and Annie Potts plays Janine, the secretary. She's from Bo Peep. Oh, she's Bo Peep. I didn't know that. And has also done lots of award-winning work on TV. Is currently starred in Young Sheldon, but we won't. <laughs> Whoa. Have to People Oof. just need, yeah. Actors need to work, okay? For every for every Ghostbusters, there's a Sheldon. For every Mash, there's Crackers, okay? So you know, Donald Sutherland has done yeah. it. Annie Potts has done it. All actors have done it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And of course, Ivan Reitman plays Slammer, and also porn star <laughs> slash comedian Ron Jeremy is in this somewhere. I couldn't find him. <laughs> Good to know. Uh, for the reception, 91% on Rotten Tomatoes' audience score of 88. That's based off 1 million reviews as well. Definitely the highest amount of reviews mm. we've covered this year. 7.8 on IMDb. From what I could tell, a lot of critics were like, this is a blockbuster, but it's a good blockbuster. And they didn't really hold it in the same regard as a smaller independent film, which I guess happens nowadays. However, it's interesting that... This became such a mega smash hit. Hmm. It's 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 a unique beast because it is a blockbuster, but it is primarily a comedy, and there's not many of those made. There are no blockbuster comedies. Um, you know, the sci-fi elements and the fantasy elements and the paranormal elements are there, and you know, drive it all together. But as well and truly, that is like a coat hung on the frame. That is, it is purely uh, a comedy film and to have it like a big blockbuster mainstream summer release as a comedy is you know normally it's an action film or it's a a big sci-fi epic or it's something like that and the comedy may be you know uh sprinkled throughout it but to 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 make a blockbuster comedy film that's very rare. I think one of the few things that gets closest to it within the last 15, 20 years is probably Bridesmaids. Bridesmaids was pretty much sold as a mm. sort of like a, uh, one of those big, you know, blockbuster comedy hits, how it was marketed and how it was sold. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a rare thing to find that comedy is normally used to, you know, to sweeten the deal of seeing a blockbuster film, but not many studios trust comedy as a genre enough to, be its main push so instead of a blockbuster you could call it a a, a ghost, a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> yes you could zach yes you could and you know what you just did <laughs> so that, was, that was terrible I apologize for that one. but we were all there for it and we shared it together so yeah <laughs> um Ooh. wow uh for the cost this cost somewhere between 25 to 30 million what do you think it made zach made oh oh this is a tricky one because obviously it did well but how well did it like uh initially because i know mm. it's now a cult classic absolutely as it should be uh i'm gonna go an 80 mil again but i'm gonna go 380 mil oh okay what do you think rob yeah, yeah, I'd go about, you know, 350 mil. Ooh, okay. Uh, it made 295. Nice. Ooh, okay. Nice. So it was around the 300 mil, yeah. at least. I was very interested in what that was in today's money, though, and that's just under 1 billion. So wow. So it's still very well. Um, it didn't gross as much as Temple of Doom. Temple of Doom was uh, about 300 from memory, but that's still a lot and very successful. Yes, mm. very much so. Very much so. 
but yes, it it, it 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 one of those films that transcends whatever genre it is. So, you know, sci-fi attracts a certain type of people, but having comedy as the main focus meant that anyone could appreciate this film. Much like later on, um, when the fourth Star Trek movie came out in '86, you know, that was primarily pushed to, for the comedy and the the relationship between the characters. So even if you're not a Star Trek fan, you could get into it. Like with you know Ghostbusters, you don't need to be you know a sci-fi nerd or a you know a ghost nerd. You can watch this film and and get hooked up in it. All right, let's just bloody go through it, mate. Um, <laughs> let's just jump into it, bruv. <laughs> <laughs> it starts off with some spooky synth music, which was really good. Let's get this out of the way. The soundtrack's just classic. It's great the whole way through. Fantastic. It's incredible. In- amazing collection of songs as well. Beautiful, like, you know, um, really funky type of, you know, jazzy um, uh, Motown element sounds. Uh, yeah, really great songs. In it. And also m- mix that with the, the eerie... Uh, you know, synth music and stuff like that is great. Perfect mm. balance. Oh, uh, I, I, I personally love synth. It's one of my favorites. And this whole like, the the getting the spooky sort of sound effect and then synthesizing it and then putting it into some poppy dance music. Oh, it's great. <laughs> and what is the opening scene, Zach? It's quite iconic. So you see, you got this librarian like <laughs> chilling in the library doing the books and whatever, and then you got the spooky books. They're all flying about, but she doesn't notice nothing because she's doing a job. She's doing her work, and then uh, she she's walking down to the back, and then all these files start flying everywhere, and she's like, "Oh, this is disorganization. I hate that." <laughs> so she runs away from that, as you would, uh, and then bumps into a spooky ghoul, and she's like, "What?" One of the most oppressive things about that whole opening sequence, it's all practical effects. So it's all like mm. the books were literally on uh, on fishing wire. The cards were opened out and there was a, a, a one of the stage hands behind with a with a straw blowing and that caused all the cards to fly out. You know. <laughs> oh, is that how they did that? Yeah, all that basic stuff. There's no like no high tech technology is so like let's do it as practical as possible so that they didn't have to mm. you know cut away from it and make you feel like it's really happening and of course nowadays it throw in you know dazzling effects to make it look pretty but it would take away that raw element of good oh, this could actually be happening i went into this uh watch through of the movie being like oh uh, you know i love this movie it's one of my all-time favorites but i gotta go in with like a critical point of view <laughs> i've got to be like is this actually good and then within the first like two minutes i went oh this is the best ever. I love it so much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is so good. It is so good. We cut to Bill Murray and he's doing this experiment. Well, I say experiment. <laughs> They've got to guess what the card is. If they get it right, they get not electrified. If they get it wrong, they do get electrified. Except he's making all the guy stuff wrong and all the girl stuff good. And it's, it's great. I love how... They don't cotton on as soon as he starts just not showing him them the <laughs> other side of the card. <laughs> oh. The character that Bill Murray plays in this, it's an interesting character. And then mm. it doesn't really... Like, there's not much character development in there. He doesn't necessarily go on a hero's journey by the end of this, which you could definitely see in the second one. There, well, there is, for, there is elements of it. There's, like, there's a... There's a heart of gold somewhere within Murray's performance. It's not all just, you know, the 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 hitting on the girls and stuff like that is never it's really weird. For me, I never perceive it as sleazy because there is this sense mm. of uh awkwardness about him. It's not like, you know, he has this mm. ambition to be a Casanova and a Don Juan, but he's just his own ineptitude and clumsiness and inherent geekiness has sort of like mm. always gets in the way of it so it comes across more as endearing than actual sleazy or a threat yeah. which is weird it's all about the interpretation and there are moments where he does show moments of weakness like when he's trying to attract Dana and you can see he's actually wounded and hurt and but he covers it up in this bravado and there is that change mm. when he's all for him any time that he realizes that this ghost stuff is actually happening <laughs> like mm. when it first happens he goes alright let's look at the money side of it okay then he sees another ghost <laughs> mm. and he goes actually no this is real but then he goes how much money do we have and it isn't until like someone close to him gets threatened so when Dana gets threatened you actually see him going alright how can I sort this out how can I figure this out and he takes you know takes it quite seriously so it's all within this veneer of the 
larrikin persona that he plays, but there are little hints because Murray is just the genius of subtlety. Oh, yeah. To, he, you can, yeah, a range of emotions and, and what his thoughts just with a look of his eyes or a smirk or something like that. So I think he goes on a, a little journey. Um, it's no, it's no sort of like, you know, uh, massive, you know, fall into the abyss and come back as the, you know, the master of two domains. But, um, but there is a little change there for, for Peter Bateman. Oh yeah. He's the, the hand solo of the Ghostbusters. <laughs> group, he is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Han, yeah. He's, a, uh, he's a little bit more awkward than Han is. Yeah. Yeah. He's, the, he's the, the nerdy, uh, version of Han Solo. Yeah. He's, he's, <laughs> yeah. he's, he's the Han Solo from Solo, the film, not so much the Harrison Ford. He's <laughs> yes, the Aaron Ehrenrich. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. He's the Aaron Ridge version as opposed to the, uh, Harrison Ford version. Um, but mm. yeah, so in, in any other actor's hands, it would come across uh, come across as off-putting or sleazy or even a bit predatory. But there's oh, this yeah. mm. there's this element to Bill Murray that you can see. There's a well, oh, for me personally, I mean, you know, it, it, other mm. people may interpret it differently, but I get this sense of humanity and awkwardness and you know, lacking in confidence in himself that he covers up with all this bravado. The image I get from him is that he's a a nerd that wants to be a womanizer <laughs> sort of guy. Yes. And he tries really hard, but he's also not quite as good as he is. And, no, he isn't. And when he fails, he can get sort of awkward about it, you know? He's just like, he just tries a little too hard. You know? <laughs> and that's the thing, like, for, for a young geeky uh, kid uh, growing up, and most of the people that I had to you know, relate to were footy stars or sports stars or, you know, impossibly good looking heteronormative Doctors. male personas on TV. Um, but then to get Ghostbusters where the heroes are obsessed with what they what 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 they study, they use that to their advantage. So that's um for for a young nerdy kid that was going, Oh, if they if they can make it, so can I. <laughs> yeah. In New York. It would be interesting to see like who the alternative casting for him would be because from the uh the movies that made us special it seems like they really had no idea that he would be in this movie until the day (laughs) probably chevy chase would be high up on that list i'm guessing if it's 84 Mm. and he definitely wouldn't pull it off he would be super sleaze the entire way through and it wouldn't work yes yeah very much so and it is that case of sort of like you know originally it was meant to be Dan was thinking of him and John Belushi, but sadly John Belushi passed away. There's talks of um, uh, Eddie Murphy because he was quite popular at the time. He you know, hit the ground running, was sat down at live, and he was 19, 19, for God's sake. Um, and so it was because of Harold Ramis's influence that they took away all this epicness of the original story and really honed it into grounding it in New York and just like the streets of New York and finding that grounded reality to it. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it was a case of there's nobody really else at the time who could fit that bill, not even on Saturday Night Live. Anyone, yeah, Chevy Chase was far too sleazy and he never really made it into the, you know, you know the pantheon of, of mainstream cinema success. You know, there's a little bit of success with the, the Lampoon films and Fletch. <laughs> they would have been very much screwed if uh, if if Bill Murray had you know at that last minute go no I'm you know but he he agreed to do it so he could also do this other film that has gone mm. the way of the dodo but it was something more artistic and challenging for for him as a as a performer and he got to make that and so then he pretty much came straight from that to to Ghostbusters and he's remembered for the film that he didn't really want to do as much as the other one I could I could see uh, Robbie Williams playing. <laughs> playing him it would have been a bit more of a a a sillier character i feel but he could probably have pulled it off obviously he wasn't as big back then (laughs) not yeah he was still just 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 coming off his tv show so yeah yeah yeah, exactly um but he could have he could have done it i feel i can see harrison ford in this role maybe yeah yeah yeah. as as a sort of jaunty womanizer sort of i could see that yeah indiana jones was george lucas and spielberg's you know saying we're never going to make a Bond movie these are our Bond movies so Indiana Jones is their Bond whereas Bond is the sleazy womanizer who you know you know disposes of them whenever he wants Indiana Jones tries to be but he's never really good at it Mm. and so that's what I like about Indiana Jones He, he does have that you know awkwardness about him um uh, and so that could have worked. It could have quite worked. And he, he's good at playing the, you know, like the nerdy, action-y type of uh, adventurer. Um, 
I just don't know how he would have worked against the rest of the team, though. Yeah. I don't think. <laughs> yeah, he wouldn't have worked in the ensemble. Yeah. It would have been Ghostbuster. Yeah. <laughs> just one. Yeah, Ghost- yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> John Ritter. Maybe John Ritter. Ooh. John Ritter was quite a, a big star at the time with Three's Company. Um, and he'd done a couple of film and stuff like that. John Ritter being, could have been quite good. I could see, yeah, him. And then with Dan Aykroyd, Eugene Levy. <laughs> I think that works. We've created an alternate universe version. The, yeah, of Ghostbusters. absolutely. Is this the darkest timeline? So maybe the mm-hmm. other Ghostbusters with John Ritter and Eugene Levy is you know in a utopian society. Absolutely. Uh, so we got a little sidetracked. <laughs> yeah. So Dan Aykroyd rocks up and is like, "Hey, we should probably go uh, check out the library." So they head over to the library. Egon is there. Bill Murray is asking uh, this librarian heaps and heaps of questions about... Oh, lady, are you crazy? What the hell? I really like how this guy comes up to him and is like, why are you asking these questions? Are these important? And he just says, back off, man, I'm a scientist. <laughs> Great line. Great line. He's, so used, he's used that line many times, you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> So they head down to the room where the film opened in. There is ectoplasm everywhere and also a Mm. spooky ghost woman. Yeah. Delicious, delicious ectoplasm. They sneak up on the ghost woman and then she uh, turns into an evil ghost woman. Mm. So they run away. Yeah, it's the classic uh, sort of uh, ghoul move where you don't don't want to surprise him. You don't want to shock him. Otherwise it startles them and they go all bagool. (laughs) Right. That's the thing. It's a horrifying image from this floating... You know, you know, quiet librarian transforming into this ghoul like. So, but the sound that comes out of her mouth is, makes her sound like Carol Channing. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I remember that being rather frightening as a as a thirteen year old child. You should see Carol Channing; she's very frightening as well. <laughs> yeah, even more. I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. She'll be sadly missed, and she was a legend of Broadway. Um, how old were How old were you when you first saw this, Rob? And did you find it frightening? Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it was. Uh, I didn't. I didn't get to see it in the cinema. I remember the first time I saw it was at my f- uh, my friend's house, Ben Trapman. We went round to his house. He had a big farm just on the outskirts of Dubbo, and um, we watched it there. And I was terrified and scared, especially of Slimer. I had a lot of nightmares about Slimer afterwards. <laughs> But I loved it. I, do, I was a very nervous kid. I, I got scared of so many different things. Um, but I loved it because it was just so funny. And so I, mm. you know, anytime there was a scare, uh, I could just remember that the Ghostbusters were there and they'd make a joke and something like that. So that final shot of, of Slimer coming up to the screen and going, ah, terrified me as a kid. I could never watch that part. Um, yeah, so I was, so yeah, I was about uh, six or seven. Wow, okay. When I first saw it. So I would have seen it on video. So I would have seen it on video. So probably about seven. I didn't see it in the cinema. So I saw it about 85. So it would have been about seven years old. Wow, okay. I loved it. I loved it so much. I could just easily watch it. And because they, they got that good balance with the ghosts that they were, you know, they were scary and creepy and in the mood, but in, in the style, but they weren't horrifying. It wasn't mm. like, you know, poltergeist level or or all that yeah. type of stuff so um they, they were half terrifying half sort of goofy yeah almost yeah 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 mm. and they, they they stayed true within their own reality they didn't sort of like you know go all scooby-doo yeah and <laughs> so you didn't see fakeman and uh egon pretend to be Oof. yeah italian waiters and go oh come on sit down mr ghost we would give you your lasagna which would have been a great scene, by the way. Yeah, yeah with with John Ritter and Eugene Levy. That's that version. <laughs> they do that in that one. Yeah, we 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 mock we mock it, but in the the utopian timeline, that scene <laughs> got it got them Academy Award. Academy Award winners, John Ritter and, and they, Eugene. absolutely, and they pulled the mask off Slimer, and it was Danny DeVito all along. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I would have got away from the words for you damn sleezes. This thing writes itself. Exactly. <laughs> it does. By the end of th- this episode, we're going to have a script. We're going we're gonna to have a script. <laughs> yeah. Let alone a prequel. We can remake the whole series. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so they've been moved off campus. The university is like, what is it that you even do? <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> Your methods are sloppy. Your results are going to be questionable. You are a poor scientist, Dr. Vickman. Dean Yeager, what a wonderful performance. He comes in for mm. one scene, nails it. Love it. Yeah. And the scene directly after this, every single time I watch it, I always think of one 
thing. So we've got Bill Murray. He's talking to Aykroyd. He's doing like a rousing speech, right? Call it fate. Call it luck. Mm. Call it karma. Yeah. And the music is rising. And just like your performance there, it feels like he's about to burst into a song. Yeah, And great, every time it? I watch it, I'm like, is this going to turn into a musical? <laughs> it's great. <laughs> mm. Um, yeah, it, it was done by Adam Sandler who break out into like a Happy Gilmore um, or sorry, um, Billy Madison. Yes, we'll go back to school. <laughs> what I noticed so like subliminally when I was a kid of how it shoots, the location becomes a, so much more a part of the film. It isn't just a place where the film is shot. It's an actual, has a living, breathing entity. So you learn so much about living in New York and how it is to be in New York. And so the way that the film is shot, you feel as if you live in that city. Um, so it's it's an excellent way of doing it, How they because they shot a lot of the interiors in LA, so they only had a, a brief amount of time actually in New York, but mm. to make it feel like a New York film is a remarkable achievement. As a young kid, I'm there going, I know what New York feels like. You know, I know what it would be like to be there. Yeah, mm, absolutely. Totally. Speaking of New York, yeah, they go to the firehouse at this point, point and they turn that into their new hq and from memory there's a story behind this firehouse isn't there rob i don't know off the top of my head yeah the nine hook and ladders uh it still operates um to this day the brave men and women who uh who work there were one of the first people to respond to um uh, the world trade center so there's a a legacy there that they were some of the first responders actually at the world trade center in 2001 so it's become an institute a, a nerdy institute Institute. When I, Caitlin and I were in New York in 2017, while I was on tour, um, we went on <laughs> we went on a, a, a Hollywood movie location yeah. um, a bus tour, and mm. so we went to all these locations for movies and stuff like that. And as we drove around, the the tour guide had lollipops to give out if you got the trivia questions right, <laughs> and it got to the point it got to the point where I had all the lollipops <laughs> and because people were I, I got to I started off by letting other people try and answer them and they couldn't get it right so I always come in with a second or third you know yeah. option and get it right and it got to the point where you know kids were asking just to get a lollipop they were nowhere near it and so I had to start actually handing out lollipops <laughs> to kids because the guy always said what's the answer um yeah, but yeah F, 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 it was so when it, when it gets to the point where the guy's like all right Lloyd, tell them the answer. <laughs> Passes a lollipop over. Yeah. And this is a fun fact. This is one of the very few uh, Jack's Box quiz questions that I got right. Oh. And no one else got it. So I felt very proud of myself. Where it was like, <laughs> where is the Ghostbusters place at? And I was like, ah, oh, yes, that one. <laughs> uh, Fantastic. It was a semi-guess, but it was like, it can't <laughs> be these other two. So it's got to be one of these. So, yeah. I didn't get many Jack's Box answers right, but that one I did, and I felt good about it. Take the victory. Yeah, Take the work. victory, Zach. Take the victory. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of taking... No. Um, <laughs> so Sigourney Weaver... Segu. ...is returning to her apartment, and Rick Moranis is there. We're introduced to his character. Ah, oh, hello there, darling. How you doing? You want to come back to my place? It'll be a great time. We'll hang out. we got a party going on. There's a party going on next week. You should come back to my party place. We'll be hanging out. It'll be a good time. Perfect. Spot on. Perfect. Perfect. It's as if Rick Moranis is here. So what happens is uh, she's heading home. She's chilling. She's got her groceries or whatever. Um, but then our, our favorite character, Hey, it's me. How you doing? He's like, Hey, you want to come back to my place? It'll be a good time. And I'm an accountant. I'm boring. Uh, and she's like, uh, maybe, maybe some other time. I really, I really wouldn't, I really wouldn't want to. And so she, she goes back to her place. Uh, puts her groceries out on the bench as you do, ready to put them away. There's a couple of eggs. Um, the eggs are just chilling. They're having a good time. Um, <laughs> and, but not only are they chilling, they they start rocking out. They're like, hey, we would like to party. We'd like to go back <laughs> to the party place. So they, they try and go back to the party, but they just sort of flop over and then s splat onto the, the counter. And she's like, what, what the heck are these eggs doing? What the hell? So she goes to put the, the party eggs away because she doesn't want any more of them jumping out. 
Uh, she opens the fridge and we see a view of heaven or purgatory <laughs> or hell. Something, Something's in her fridge, which really, sh- something's gone off in there. She's left it for far too long. And uh, a heaven hellscape has emerged from her fridge. And there's a dog thing. And the dog thing... Uh, Yell, yells a certain thing. Does anybody? Does anybody know? Zool. Zool. <laughs> Zool. 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 Yeah. And she's like, Zool. <laughs> she's like, hmm, Zool. Zool. Yes, I, I recognize that ancient archaic figure. I'm going to close the fridge now. Goodbye. Close. I'm leaving. <laughs> this has been fun. You can have my fridge now. <laughs> I've got to go. Luckily, earlier. On her TV was playing an advertisement for the Ghostbusters. And she's like, haha, I know how to deal with this. I'll get the professionals yeah. on it. I don't know why anyone would be convinced by that ad. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, look, if you have a ghosty ghoul in your fridge <laughs> that's spouting about Zool, you got to get the professionals in. Yeah, look, uh, I, I hate to... You know, pull rank here, Sandro. But you know, of mm. as a you know a, a man who was growing up in the eighties, this is all we had for commercials. This is long before mm. commercials became as sophisticated as the ads you see on TV or uh, indeed on the internet nowadays. That <laughs> at the time in early nineteen eighties you know, culture, that was the height of a classy ad. <laughs> I know. Oh wow. Ew, you primitive mortal beings with your silly ads. <laughs> we are now out of a higher being. You have. Our you've... ads are all about how to expand your penis size. <laughs> yes. Or hot singles that are in your area. You went straight there. That was the first one you go to. Absolutely. That's the pinnacle of advertising. <laughs> the peak, as it were. Hey. Yes. Just going to sit in that for a while. <laughs> Please move on. Let it stew. Uh, yeah, so yeah. she goes by the uh, the HQ. I love how she approaches. She approaches and yep. Bill Murray just pops up in the background, kind of like a rabbit. He bounds over. He's so excited he for like, their first customer. He, like, leaps over his desk. So good. Just to make sure he can greet her. There's a lot There's a lot of it here. This is a, good, a prime example of why he doesn't really come across as a sleeve. There's no leering. There's no, you know, overtly sexual behavior. It's all very... He seems to be, like, in awe of her. He's like an eager puppy mm. as opposed to a slobbering, you know, beast. He's very much a case of, mm. like, when he gets mm. there, he just go, hello, I'm Peter Vakeman. Oh, it's, it's all we do day in, day out and around here. And, you know, there's all this type of stuff. He says, like, the line dropped, you know, I want to take her back to her apartment and check her out. I mean, uh, check out her apartment. Yep. But it's more like... Yeah, there's no slobbering, slobbering sex beast. It's the- yeah, he's too much of a goofball to be really sweet. Yeah, yeah. and um, Sigourney Weaver does a great balance of she never really comes across as a damsel in distress. She seems really w- mm. well held together, but she's just way over her head and she doesn't really understand what's going on because it, you know, it, so it makes it believable that I'm watching it going, come on, you've blown up aliens. You've blown up an entire starship to get away from aliens. Mm. You've, you've hung out with gorillas in the mist. Um, I don't <laughs> believe that you're really a damsel in distress, but yeah, you know, she's very much a case of she's mm. a capable, strong, independent woman who's there going, I don't know what the hell's going on. And unfortunately, yeah. or fortunately, mm. she ends up with a group of, you know, awkward, socially awkward nuff-nuffs who are uh, going to save the day. Her p- performance in this has always just been, like, one of my favourites from her. It's so... Mm. She just plays so well with comedians, which up until this point, you wouldn't have thought that she was good at this, but she's incredible. I'm going to go out on a on a limb here. I'm going to say she's a pretty good actor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you guys. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a hill I can die well, on. Yeah, I see a future um, here. Yeah, definitely. She at least did two whole acting <laughs> in that movie. Look, Minimum. You, know, you, don't want to, you don't want to play safe when you're doing a podcast. You want to stand out in the crowd, Zach. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Yeah. She did more than three. <laughs> Acting. More than three years of film. Is that, is that a solid more than three or is that a light? Yeah, that's a solid more than three. That's a hard more than three for me. So he's like, hey, there's nothing in your fridge. 
by the way, I love you. Oh, fucking great. <laughs> just going to put that <laughs> yeah. out there. Oh, yeah. How about I just go back to the HQ and, you know, I'll try and figure this out. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, like, I'm glad that he's concerned about what she's eating. There was a lot of junk food. <laughs> <in there. laughs> yeah. There's, 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 a, there's a couple of things that, like, a bit of spam and stuff. That's not healthy. Come on. No wonder you're seeing visions of Zool if you're eating Yeah, spam. there's some, like, bologna <laughs> right. in there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. oh. That's a lot of meat. Mm. That's not good for you. No, yeah, she needs some roughage. A lot of red meat. There's two uh, cans of Coca-Cola in there. Each of them turned uh, to the opposite side, so you really just get a full view of the <laughs> yeah the product that yeah. is placed inside of this fridge. What are you saying? What are you trying to say? Product somewhere? placement. <laughs> what do you mean? She just happened to place them in there with their logos facing the camera. <laughs> everyone, everyone, everyone puts their cans of Coke. In the fridge that way, I, I can't. I, I, yeah. Yeah, I do it all the time when I go to put my can of soda in the fridge. I guess because I'm, I haven't had it yet. Yeah, yeah, I haven't had it yet, so I'm putting it in the fridge. I make sure to turn the logo so I know what it is when I open the fridge. Exactly. You... If the logo wasn't facing it to me, it could be any soda. I wouldn't know. You can't beat the real thing. Uh, we cut back to the headquarters classic quote from Janie. We got one. Oh. It's so good. Goosebumps every time. We got one. <laughs> and that brilliant piano. That brilliant piano solo. <laughs> great. Yep. Great song. Mm. As they're like, wait, that's the that's the bell. <laughs> what does that mean? Oh, right. Yeah, we got to do a thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's got that beautiful moment when they're all eating the Chinese. And this uh, going, yeah, yeah go, this Exquisite meal is the last of the petty cash. <laughs> and then just stops to eat, kind of goes, slow down, chew your food. Just beautiful little moments like that. Yeah. So, yes. It's good. It's great. The music plays thumping, you know, piano and um, brilliant sort of like old school, almost swing style, um, funky uh, 80s jive starts playing as Ecto-1 roars out into the streets of New York. Now, I don't want to, um, I don't want to poke holes in this movie. I I think it's a pretty flawless film. However, um, they have established just moments ago that they don't have Uh any money. Uh, yet who designed their logo? It looks pretty expensive. It looks like an expensive logo. Yeah, why do you think they don't have any money? Yeah, (laughs) exactly. That's all the, they've spent all their money on fixing the car and getting a logo and getting costumes and having, you know, having a, a, a nuclear accelerator on their back. So they've gone, all right, that's all we've got. And they had the last bit of, you know, about 50 bucks to get some Chinese. (laughs) That's some good Chinese. The shopping list just goes on, Sandra. The shopping list goes on. Chinese... Nuclear accelerators, a really expensive logo, renovating a hearse. It's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it all adds up. didn't exactly paint the thing after they bought the Chinese. (laughs) You know for a fact the Chinese was bought after the logo was painted. (laughs) Otherwise, the the paint would still be drying as they're driving away. They're like mid-paint, leaning out the window, painting on the logo as as they're going. No, no, no. I think it's canonical that the logo was was bought and painted before the Chinese food. So I think they're in the clear there. <laughs> anyway, they go to this hotel. They've got to head up to the 12th floor. Uh, I love the scene in the elevator where Ackroyd is like, switch me on. And so Egon switches him on and then sneaks to the other side <laughs> of the elevator. <laughs> they're trying to be discreet because that's one of their things. They say they'll be discreet. Also, coming up on the scenes, I have a little issue with their discreetness. Because <laughs> um, uh, that's the joke. But there's just a random person around, and he's like, huh, who are you guys? And Bill Murray's like, oh, yeah, uh, someone saw a cockroach. They're exterminators. It's a great one. It's such an American character. Mm. The American, that sole New York guy with the big moustache and the the gangster hat. Just they're going, what are you supposed to be, some kind of cosmonaut? (laughs) And instead of going, (laughs) oh, no, actually, we're doing this type of stuff. And Bill Murray just goes, no, you want to throw in, you know, throw some shade at me? I'll throw some shade back. And now we're exterminators. Someone sees a cockroach on 12. Mm. That's some cockroach. Bite your head off, man. <laughs> and then it goes, going up, it goes, I'll take the next one. So New York. I love it. <laughs> yes. It's a great oh, scene. The look for Slimer is pretty great as well. I love how Slimer is eating stuff and, like, he's completely translucent. You yeah. can see through him, transparent, I mean. Like, you can see right mm. through Slimer. However, the food that is kind of, like, landing on his chin isn't. And it looks incredible. 
Like, you've got mm. this s- solid food just sitting on him, but you can see through him. It's phenomenal stuff. The effects are great. And that stuff like when he st- starts to pour the wine and it goes through. And so just the levels, levels of intercutting. No, c- no CGI at that point. It was all, you know, photo, mm. photo realism and sh- within camera stuff. And it's just incredible, mm. incredible uh, for something that wasn't from an established company at the time, like IL, ILM or anything like that, they did a wonderful job. Yeah, absolutely. It was an offshoot from memory. Again, check out the movies that made us episode. But this this basically created a tech company, like a yeah an FX mm. company. It's great. I love I love Slimer. He he could really use his own sort of show of some sort. <laughs> sort of maybe cartoony. An, maybe an animated show being the lead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Like, the kids would love it. I don't know about you guys. Yeah. But I think that show would be garbage. Uh, great. Um, <laughs> fantastic. A show that's real and also mm. extreme. Yes. Mm. But not actually. Yes. Yeah. But get less and less away from the whole point of what the original film was and focus more and more on a secondary ghosty green character. Yeah, that's a smart move. That's a real <laughs> smart move. Everybody loves the Puss in Boots movies. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> Antonio Banderas is great. Uh-huh. So they head into the banquet hall, which is where Slimer is. Ackroyd is like, um, this is something pretty important that I forgot to tell you. Don't cross the streams. That would be very bad if you did that. The whole like, oh yeah, it will disintegrate every atom in your body or whatever. Oh, mm. thanks for telling us now. <laughs> good, good, good on you for telling. Oh, just before you start shooting, you know. <laughs> oh no, we've already been shooting. Let's go on a little oh, bit. Oh yeah, further. that's right. They had already shot at Slimer, hadn't they? And of course, we've missed the famous line where, of course, you know, Pete gets an uh, intimate relationship with uh, the ghost and says the famous line, "He slimed me." He slimed me. He slimed me. He slimed me. Crikey. Slimed me. And he's like, <laughs> oh, great. Save some for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's great, Ray. Save some for me. Great line. Yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that type of stuff helped me as a kid. Like that scene of him getting hit by it scares me a bit as it scared me a bit as a kid because I go, oh, no, what's going to happen to Pete? And then to see how they all respond to it. They're not horrified. You've got mm. Ray there going, this is amazing. And then you've got Egon going, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Save some for me. I love that was for me as a kid. Went, oh, okay, cool. Mm. This is something not to be scared of they capture slimer it looks good it's a good scene of course the ah oh, the lions wrap it all up though one of the best lines in the film i reckon <laughs> i really like um their dis- their discreet way of capturing slimer which is to completely destroy the ball. destroy yeah. everything like, literally nothing was spared <laughs> yeah. in their destructive way because it kind of starts off as them destroying the room to get Slimer. But then by the end of it, it's just Bill Murray being like, I've always wanted to do this, and just pulls the tablecloth under it. Mm. The flowers are still standing. <laughs> uh, they were not, by the way. I had a criticism from there, because he knocked over some of the flowers. Ah, there we go. And that's why this film is getting an old, you know. <laughs> yep, exactly. My point. And what's, the f- what's your favourite line, uh, Sandra? Oh, we came, we saw, or we kicked it. Bleh. No, I messed it up. Oh, right. Sandro, <laughs> come on! <laughs> Boo! No. Oh, he failed! No! Just as he went over the finish line as well, uh, just tripped living. over and faced it. Like, it's like Michael Caine's first film in a movie. He was in a World War II film. He was like an extra. He had one line, and the line was, the Germans are coming. And he ran up, and they had all this stuff going on, like explosions and stuff like that. And yeah, it was a big, expensive take. And he ran up, and the first line he said was, the Germans are crumbing. Oh, crap. <laughs> but, you know, he got a career after that. So, you know, you will too, Sandro. <laughs> Absolutely. You're the Michael Caine of podcasts. I will be in the 2022 reboot of Don't Blame It on Rio. <laughs> uh, oh, no, please don't. If you do, just shut it down. Just burn the <laughs> sabotage it. We came, we saw, well, we kicked its ass. It's a great yeah, right. And he did yeah. a couple of different takes, didn't he? He did like two or three, and they just went, nah, that's the best one. Like, you, you can see, I think it's in yeah, the, uh, the movies that made us or in the uh, the docos and stuff like that. You see him come in and do a couple of others, and you go, nah, 
that you know there's only mm. one line that could be said when that opens up yeah i think he did quite a few because there is quite a bit of improvisation in this from murray and i think he did the nicholas cage thing of just giving the director and editor just as much different takes as possible yeah, yeah. rick moranis did that as well moranis pretty much rewrote the character in his own way because lewis tully was meant to be uh john candy but john candy didn't really want it and turned it down so they went to uh um Moranis and Moranis said, uh, the way you've written it, uh, no, I've got a different take. And so Lewis Tully is all from Rick Moranis. And so, yeah, Moranis and uh, Murray did a lot of riffing on ideas and taking taking inspiration from other things and, you know, giving uh, the editors and uh, Ivan Reitman more to play with. That's interesting because then with the sequel, they would have been writing him as the character he created Hence why the sequel is a little weird when it comes to his character. Yeah, there is one good line, though. Where I, I never really got Janine and um, uh, Lewis getting together. I, I liked Janine and Egon together. Um, but there's a great line where Janine's trying to hit on Lewis Tully. And he she says the line, so do you live alone? And he looks and he goes, well, I used to have a roommate, but my mom moved to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> The media is going nuts. They're just loving the Ghostbusters. We get a montage of them being on so many things. Larry King's talking about them. Casey Kasem! Someone asks him, how is Elvis? Have you seen him lately? And then we get (laughs) Dan Aykroyd blowjob ghost scene. Uh, I think you mean a ghost job. (laughs) It's called in the business. Uh, I... What? Why? (laughs) Because it's great, Sandro. It's- this is how good this is how good the film is. It is such a good film that everyone forgives that scene. <laughs> everyone not everyone doesn't just forgive it, they forget about it. Everyone forgets about it. Because let's never talk oh, about I it. Oh, I never forget about that scene. <laughs> One of my favorites. But we always said, let's not talk about it until we like you do a deep dive podcast on it. Then everyone goes, What the fuck was with that scene? <laughs> But nobody leads with that. Nobody goes, you know why Ghostbusters is such a great film? That ghost blowjob scene. Mm-hmm. I, I push in my glasses a bit. Well, you see, it was important to establish <laughs> um, yeah. that uh, when when you're getting a blow, a ghost blowy, a goey or something, <laughs> uh, your eyes cross. What a what a great what a yeah. scene! What a scene that's in this movie. It's the one thing that very much represents the comedy films at that time, which was oh, yeah. <laughs> you know your meatballs, your screwballs, your type of stuff like that, which was like you know the the titillation mixed with laughter, and so that's very much a mm. one vestige of that very dated of the time era mm. that they brought mm. into the comedies because everything else is timeless within that film and you could take that scene out and it's gone and it and it just yeah. stands up on its own. Yeah. So it would have it would have cost them literally nothing <laughs> yeah. not to put that <laughs> yeah. scene George, in. George Lucas spent millions of dollars to add in extra shit that we didn't need in the original trilogy. If you just take mm. the scene out, just you know it's just one pair of scissors. Snip snip uh, this is when Winston joins the crew. Yay. Every time I watch this movie, I'm always like, oh yeah, he joins in like kind of late, doesn't he? He comes in, yeah, like, well past the halfway point. Which is really interesting. But he's great. Yeah. Oh, and what I like about him is that representation of, you know, he's the working man. He's not the scientist. He comes in, he's just looking for a job. And so he's learning mm. as he goes along. But he never comes across as dumb or stupid or anything. He's just there going, just stop talking crap. Just give me... Give me what what this yeah. actually means. I'll believe whatever the hell you want me to, as long as I get the yeah, job. Yeah, exactly. I just need money. Come on. Yeah, and he's great. I love I love his character. It's amazing because he's just like, oh yeah, ghosts. Cool. I'm chill with that. Yeah, <laughs> you're paying me. Absolutely. Yeah, let's go get some ghosts. I'd love a movie with him being trained. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I would like to. I would have liked to have seen a bit more of him actually out on the field, like because he shows it quite a bit in Ghostbusters too. I know it's not as good a film, but it's still a Ghostbusters film. But like him and mm. Dan going out, uh, him and Ray going out down into the um, the old railway lines and stuff like that. So you see, you know, how he oh, was yeah. a part of the team as opposed to just you know another guy. I, I I like him because he's also kind of the most like socially inept. <laughs> I don't know if that's a word, <laughs> um, but like the rest of them are nerds. So he's he's sort of the the middleman there, where they they might see a ghost and go, Whoa! and he's like, oh yeah, that's another ghost. Let's get him. <laughs> yeah. 
He's, he's sort of that interesting character. We'll talk about coming up because it's a, another scene later on. It's one of my favourite scenes in the whole film with him and Ray out on patrol. And so you've got the purely scientist point of view coming from the mm. the religious point of view. So it's one of my favourite mm. moments. Hey, Ray, Ray, do you believe yep. in God? And Ray says, never met him. <laughs> and and yeah. just that, that fact of Winston's coming from a religious, biblical point of representation of what is going on. Um you know, and that, that 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 debate has been going on for centuries. Obviously, science versus religion, but to have it addressed in such a beautiful way, such a subtle way as well, is um, mm. is, uh, is is beautifully done. That is such a good scene. One of my favorites yeah. as well. Look, it it was kind of uh, kind of doomsday happening there. You know. Yeah. Zul's kind of gonna f things up. Definitely, def- like yeah. Yeah. yeah, the dead were rising from the grave. It's the it's 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 mm. it's, it's it's a perfect moment of everything becomes a bit more real and it's a beautiful delivery from a wonderful actor. So Ernie the, Hudson... The Titanic shipping in. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the next one. Um, the two brothers who went to the electric chair. Oh, no, that's the other one as well. No, nope, that other movie. Next, <laughs> next one. Uh, let's talk about Walter Peck. He shows up. He's from the Environmental Protection Agency. He's like, hey, Ghostbusters, you're not doing good environmental stuff. I want to sh- sh- shut you down. Bill Murray really uh, puts his foot in it, I think. Uh, like, <laughs> off the bat, he's just... He does not treat this guy very well. He kind of make he, he does not make peace with him. He makes an enemy here. Uh, although, of course, he doesn't care. And am I wrong in saying Walter Peck comes in, like... With the best intentions. I don't think he reveals himself to be a true dick until later on. I th- oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And he only responds because Bill Murray is such an asshole to him. Mm. Yeah, exactly. He Like, like Bill Murray causes him to be an asshole. <laughs> like, Bill Murray's like, oh, yeah, go, go shove a banana up your bum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do you remember that, that part, Sandro, in the, um, <laughs> in the film? I think you may have watched the wrong... <laughs> Hey, you, you stupid investigator boy. Get this banana, <laughs> shove it up your bum. I remember that. Do you guys not well, remember I, that? I, I, that I love, what I love about Oldie Bitter Goody is that there's the version that you and I watch, and then there's the version that Zach watches. So I'm going, go, great. Okay, yeah. that's good. We get to review yeah, two. I watch, I watch only bootleg. <laughs> you <laughs> watch the Spanish bootleg. El, el Gostia Basta. I watched The Terminator 2. The Italian, oh, the Italian Alien Terminator versus too. Terminator movie. Check out our episode of No Doubt Spinoff for more uh, information about Shocking yeah. Dark, uh, the Italian ripoff of Terminator 2 that's actually just aliens. <laughs> yeah, and it's also like classic 80s in that all the people who care about the environment are the bad guys. Classic 80s. We've seen it so much this year. They do it mm. all the time. Mm. We get Egon's Twinkie analogy after this. Now, oh, yes. this film really uh, set up Twinkies for me. A big part of Ghostbusters w- w- was me always being like, I want a Twinkie. Twinkies look good. I really want one. And then when I eventually had one, I think it might have been 2013, uh, maybe? Was that when they started coming to Australia? Something like mm. that. Yeah, I mean, it's not a part of you know, Australian culture. We never, there's so many of those uh, American mm. sweets that we never really got, like Count Chocula. Is, <laughs> I say it's a sweet. It's a breakfast cereal. Yeah, right. Um <laughs> But yeah, uh, Cheerios and all that type of stuff. And, you know, the mythical Twinkie was always something we never got here. When the American brand stores started opening within the last 10 or so years, you could always get Twinkies there. And for our 2014 tribute to Ghostbusters, we had to go hunt down as many Twinkies as we could. Um, yeah. I remember that. I think that was the first time I actually had a Twinkie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Was, yeah. was when you gave me one. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, I was blessed that day. And you know what? I thought it was all right, Sandro. Maybe you overhyped it. But I thought it was like, oh, I get it. It's like a little little sponge cake with a bit of cream in it. That's pretty good. And I'm like, om nom 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 nom. That was pretty good. Nice. So I was very satisfied with my Twinkie experience. That's what she Don't said. Don't know about you guys. Yeah. Yeah, my first time wasn't. Yeah, it was a little bit awkward. <laughs> um, with the Twinkie, I mean. Is this a euphemism? Oh, 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 is this... <laughs> It's all euphemisms for something right now. Yeah, it's all euphemisms for ghost jobs. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yes. All right, the gargoyles come in at this point. They're alive, and one's breaking out. It's a great Ooh. scene. The claw moves, and then you can see the claw underneath it. And the red eye. Dude, I love this scene. Mm. They're probably my favorite, like, prop monster things in this movie, the... the- 
ghost dog things that are like half gargoyle dog creatures. Yeah. I love the, the like statues of them that looked so menacing and then just them breaking out of it. Oh, oh, they're real things. Oh, no. Yeah. And the sound of them, that deep guttural like purring is really, really good. It's like a purr or yeah, a, yeah, yeah. like a, uh, yeah, it's just a really amazing. The practical effects for them is great. There's one scene coming up that perhaps is the only part of this film that doesn't look amazing. But with when they're standing still, it's menacing, it's scary, it's yeah. just spot on. I, re- I remember distinctly... Was I 13? No, I must have been earlier. It must have been like 10 or something. That those were the things that scared me. I was like, oh god, those things are terrifying. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this man, this accountant is going to die. <laughs> <laughs> he is going to be eaten by a dog creature. Sigourney, she returns to her apartment and Moranis is there. Tully is there and... Uh, and he's like, hey, my party's happening. Uh, I think you mean, hey, my party's happening here. You want to come into this party, man? Come on, get in here. We're having a great old time. Yeah. I believe that's how he says that. And she's like, uh, no, I, I've already organized a date with the actor Bill Murray. Um, he was coming around. <laughs> so, no. And then he's like, and he's like, oh, Bill Murray, that's understandable. He's a great actor. You have a good time. Maybe you can come afterwards. That would be fantastic. <laughs> Uh, so she goes into her kitchen, and this is the scene that really got me as a kid, which is when she sits down on the chair, the arms come through, lock her in, and then she just shoots towards the kitchen. Yeah. That's the one that got me, yeah. Gee, Sigourney does well with it, doesn't he? That scream, that deep scream when she's being dragged away. Oh, my gosh. That's acting. Oh, yeah, she sells it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I thought she was dead. As a child, I was like, oh, that lady died. <laughs> She is dead. <laughs> That's why I was so terrified of the the other guy dying, because I thought they were just being eaten <laughs> by these dog creatures. Little yeah. did we know. Yeah. That they had to find each other to fuck. Yep. Yep. To get their ghost jobs on. <laughs> <laughs> to get their ghost jobs on to open up a door. That's how I open doors on a daily basis. You could have just opened the door, I mean. Come on. I need to open this door so I hold a seance. Yep. And get a ghost mm-hmm. job. And then the door opens. Yeah. Go put your key into someone's gate. Yep. <laughs> we cut to Tully's party, and there's another gargoyle jumping around that apartment, smashing things up. And it doesn't look terrible, but... Oh, when it smashes mm. through the door. Yeah, when it smashes through the door, when it's running down the street, it almost looks like it's like stop-motion clay, but then it also looks a little bit too janky, kind of moves from side to side a little bit, but then when it's standing Mm. still, it's great. It's the only part of this movie that I think, in terms of the visuals, doesn't hold up super well. Yeah, it especially doesn't hold up that well within the the bright fluorescent lights of the corridors. It definitely, you can, yeah, the the explosion of the door is impressive, but you see that. And it's a fun, I think, because you laugh at the fact that the dog hits the wall and then collapses. And th- that <laughs> funny laugh makes you yeah. forget for a second. You go, oh, that wasn't as convincing. And then it cuts back to the scene where it's just standing there in the in the corridor. And you go, all right, there it is, good again. Um, yeah. sa- same mm. with the scene when it bounds out through the hotel over the, you know, you kind of laugh at the fact that Tully is there going, help! And then you go, oh, hang on, that wasn't that good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's weird how half the time it looks good, half the time it doesn't. But I, d- I didn't mind it so much. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's not an issue at all, yeah. Well, yeah, the, the scene, the scenes where it doesn't look good isn't there aren't as many as those those beautiful yep. shots and yep. like I think the best part of the effects of them are when Dana and, Lo- and Lewis are transforming back into the dogs and they look really mm. really good mm. that's a good moment um, but yeah the running yeah. and the slamming through the doors is a it d- does show the shortcomings but it it's it's quite few and far between compared to how they look in every other scene oh definitely and like that's something that they haven't really perfected today the movement (laughs) of objects like that i mean bloodshot came out three months ago and the ending fight scene for that looks as about as good as this sequence so (laughs) yeah it's Mm. not it's not great but anyway well it's it's a sad state of affairs when a you know uh animatronic dog has more facial expression than Vin Diesel. But <laughs> <laughs> isn't he just an animatronic dog? <laughs> he's he's just three animatronic dogs stacked on top of each other with a trench coat. <laughs> <laughs> so the dog it gets Tully outside of a restaurant and we're like, oh no, what's gonna happen? He gets eaten. He gets eaten. Bill Murray he rocks up to the apartment, he sees the mess 
that's going on. There's yeah. police everywhere talking about some sort of bear has attacked this small apartment. He walks into uh, Dana's room and uh, she's got a wind machine. Her hair's <laughs> blowing all over the place. That's what happens when you get possessed, man. You get possessed, you automatically get a wind machine. That's a part of the contract of being yeah, possessed. Yeah, the ghosts bring their own. They're like, hold up, <laughs> let me set this up in two seconds. Bill Murray's about to come through the door. Quick, quick, quick. <laughs> and give her a gothic makeover, obviously. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Robert Robert Smith from The Cure showed up and went, this is how you do your eyeliner now. He knows the ghost personally. <laughs> he you know? does. They've, he they've he does. Years. They did One of their best gigs was in front of ghosts. Are you the key master? It's good. Mm. Not that I know of. <laughs> I want you inside me. Sounds to me like you've already got two people in there already. <laughs> <laughs> got him. And there, there's, there is that moment where goes, you know, you want this body. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 no. I can't do this yet. No, nope, no. Nope. Yeah, it's, it's part of my policy. Never get involved with possessed people. Great line. Yeah. And if this was any other film from the 80s, you know what would have happened. However, it's not. And we thank the yep. Lord for it. <laughs> But yes. we do have to, we do have to wait for later on where we have a possessed Dana and a possessed Lewis um, do the <laughs> yeah. deed. So well, they had to open a door, you know. It's the only yeah. way. If you know what I mean, Zach. I don't understand. What are you What are you talking about? Can someone explain this? <laughs> I'm, I'm confused. The key is the penis, and the gate <laughs> is the vagina. <laughs> <laughs> I've just got the gif of going Boof, explosion. <laughs> There is no Dana, there is only, only Zool. Zool. And how awesome is Sigourney Weaver there? Like, the rolling of the eyes back and... Uh, oh. Yeah. She floats above the bed. It looks incredible. It's shot really well. Yeah. Yeah, it's mm. so good. Yeah. I was expecting to he- her head to, like, spin around and then, <laughs> you know, the priest yeah. to just run out of there. I know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. almost does. It, yeah. Mm. Again... 84, incredible year for this sort of stuff. Mm. You had this, uh, you had the gore in Toxic Avenger, of course, coming up, Nightmare on Elm Street, Mm. the practical effects incredible for that. Just a great year for for the visuals. Which one came out in 84? The first one. Oh, the first one? one. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 Very first one. Yeah. It's no Dream Warriors, but it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Rick Moranis is, is running around telling people he's the key master. That's one of the funniest scenes in the film, I think. It's so and good. He almost has sex with a horse. <laughs> <laughs> he does. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't really think about the ramifications of that till now. You don't you don't pick that up until you're older and you're more yeah, and you're more you know, you destroy your morals by watching movies and, and reading comic books on the internet. As a kid you're there going, Oh, it's funny because he's talking to a horse and then you go when you're older you go, Ooh, that could have got awkward. I uh no up till now time it was hard <laughs> funny he was talking to a horse. Till Rob Lloyd mentioned, Oh yeah, he was about to bang that horse. I was like Ah, ha, ha, he's talking to a horse. That's funny. Oh, oh, thanks, Rob Lloyd. That, <laughs> that put a different tone on that scene for me. Sorry for corrupting you. This is the perfect yeah, representation no. of sorry, not sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The police pick him up. They drop him off at the HQ. I love the line from Janie. You are so kind to take care of that man. You know, you're a real humanitarian. I don't think he's human. <laughs> I don't think it's human. Yeah, I love that great. scene. Like the New York guy, the New York cops, they're going, oh, we're taking him here. They don't want him. So we thought we'd bring him to you. What do you reckon? Mm-hmm. And Rick is so funny in that scene, but he's fully possessed. Are you the, you know, are you the key master? It's great. Are you the gatekeeper? I think you mean, are you the key master? I need to find the key I don't even master. know why I tried to do this impersonation. Zach just, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's got all the cards. <laughs> Is the personality of the uh, gargoyle he's possessed by, is the personality of that gargoyle almost exactly the same as Tully's personality, or does this gargoyle kind of take on some forms of its host's personality? Because it doesn't seem like Zul's anything like Dana, but Mm. this one, very much like Tully. Yeah, it seems like, yeah, it's got, uh, Zul's got a lot easier job to do that can easily just bring this imposing demonic force through the excellence that is Dana Barrett slash mm. Sigourney Weaver. Whereas poor old Vince Clothos has to, has to filter his evil through the awkwardness that is the exquisite beauty of Rick Moranis. So it doesn't yeah. have that same weight to it. But the words he is saying is quite horrifying, but it comes through the filter of Rick Moranis. <laughs> so you just go, oh, 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 oh that's amazing. 
Yeah, I think it's it's I think it's like a different person driving the car. You know, <laughs> mm. the, ca- the car itself doesn't change. Sigourney Weaver, she's like a a hot rod, a race car. You know, <laughs> she she can be intimidating if she wants to be. You know, she's got that. You know, but yeah. the Beetle car <laughs> that is is like honking at you and trying to be scary, but it's just not very intimidating. That is <laughs> Even a good if analogy. the driver tries to be, <laughs> it's just not going to happen. <laughs> the environmental people show up and they're like, all right, we got this warrant. We're shutting down your containment system. And they do it. It all shuts down. The ghosts escape. This really annoyed me because this guy's like, shut it all down. And they're like, hey, yo, this could cause an explosion. And he's like, eh, no, it can't. You're lying. <laughs> they're, they're not. They're very clearly not. And they really should have tried to stop him a bit more, I feel. And can I just say, Harold Ramis is so good in that scene. And especially mm. the ending oh, yeah. when he's just like going to be arrested by Walter Peck, who's yelling and screaming at him. And then for the first time in the whole film, Egon just loses it and just goes, you're a mother. Yeah. And goes, hey, I was just like, oh my god, he got snapped. It's great. Oh, I love the visuals of, like, the ghosts coming out of the fire station and then them just floating through the air. Great song as well. Breathe. It's really, like... Mm. 80s funky type of you know psychedelic but it's really menacing as well it's a great moment with all the ghosts just filter out through the streets of new york you could call it uh, a spec tur <laughs> yeah. yeah you can do it you can do it keep going keep going zach you can do this you can Spectacular. do it stick the landing stick the landing come on you can do it baby <laughs> Uh, a spectre take real, uh, no, and fail. Yeah. And the Germans are crumbing. We brought it all back. Yeah. Uh, um, they, uh, they go to do an exposition dump on why that particular building, the building that Dana is, why that is the, the building where everything seems to be centered on. And they do the exposition dump in the best place to do it, uh, in jail. It just adds so much to the scene. It's great. With all the inmates shuffling in. I love this. It's just, just convicts around like, what the frick are these guys talking about? And if anyone's going to do an exposition dump, you want it to be Bill Murray, uh, Dan Aykroyd, and um, Howard Ramis, because it's done so well. Like the dynamic of going, you never studied, no study. So for goodness sake, whoa, somebody's coming. Just think of bring a song and dance and, you know, slapping each other on the head. And- <laughs> Why does he start dancing and singing? What is... What is going on? <laughs> it's great. Ah! It's great because they're just all hovering around, so he just draws attention to it and makes them all feel awkward. But <laughs> so be good. Yeah, I don't know what's happening. It's confusing yeah, me. It's great. I love it. It's so good. Yeah, it's great. But yeah, then the mayor is like, I want to see these guys. So they go and see the mayor. And um, do we know who? And and just a bit of a reference for those of you diehard fans, you've got the you've got uh, the dad. From Family Matters. Ah, oh, there you go. So I couldn't find Ron Jeremy, but I could find the dad from Family Matters for you. <laughs> and that is more important. To be <laughs> it's just way more absolutely, way more important. Agreed. Peck rocks up as well, and again another great line because Peck is dickless, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He has penis. Yes, it is true. This man has no dick. Incredible line. <laughs> Incredible line. Mm. Oh my god. So they're, they're all in this room and the mayor's like, what the heck is going on? And the Ghostbusters are like, hey, well, this is kind of this guy's fault. But moving on from that, uh, we can save the day if you just let us. And then this other guy without a dick, he's like, oh, man, I have no dick. But also, I hate these guys. Um, and they're yep. like, yes, it's true. He has no dick. Um, yep. And then the, the mayor's like, hmm. Well, I can't trust a guy without a dick, so get out of here, dickless. What version did you watch? <laughs> the correct version. Is this the scene that, that Ron Jeremy was in? <laughs> I think so. Look, in, uh, this, in, in this version, in this version, Ron Jeremy played uh, Peter Vakeman, so it's a whole other... <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a weird... Uh, it's a different one, anyway. So all, all the yeah. sleazy and predatory stuff that we tried to... That, that Bill Murray kept away from it, Ron Jeremy was just let loose. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. I've, 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 I've dampened the mood. So, uh, yeah, the mayor is like, all right, we want your help. The army rolls out. There's a bunch of crowd. There's a, There's bunch, a bunch of, of crowd. crowd. There's a bunch of fans. 
outside of uh, outside of the building where they are heading to, that they were like, "This is great! This is great!" The Ghostbusters they get out, they're about to enter the building, but then the ground it cracks open, they fall through. It looks amazing, and mm. and everyone's like, "Oh no, are the Ghostbusters dead?" And they are. It's the end of the film. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's weird. In my bootleg version, there was a whole different ending. <laughs> yeah, my version, they all end singing and dancing to to a Bollywood yeah. thing. Yeah, that was my one as well. Well, it's interesting <laughs> at that moment, because I remember, like, I think it's in um, uh, the films that made us, they talk about the fact they still hadn't secured the rights for the title, because obviously the rights for uh, Ghostbusters was owned by Filmation, who made a, mm. uh, a, a short-lived TV series in the 60s called Ghostbusters. With the gorilla. With, uh, with, with Tracy the gorilla and uh, two of the guys from <laughs> F Troop. Um, and mm. they were still trying to figure out, because they would have had to pay an enormous amount of money to get the rights for the name. Um, and so they were thinking of other old titles like Ghostbreakers, which was a title of a, a Bob uh, Bob Hope film back in the 40s. Mm. Um, and so they were kind of tossing with that. And then they got to the scenes in New York where they have to be chanting and they just went, fuck it. And so they got the entire crowd to chant Ghostbusters. And they, and so Ivan Reitman said, whatever happens now, we've got to get Ghostbusters as a title, which I think was such yeah, a ball, yeah. such a baller move. Mm. Oh, so Absolutely. good. Yeah. It's such a weird scene though, because it does try to do a fake out where you're like, are they dead? No, they're not. <laughs> but the only reason they do that is because of, I guess, the crowd, but also the visuals of them falling into the ground. It's just a weird scene, and I'm not sure why it's there. <laughs> they climb up to the top of the roof. Uh, they get struck by a purple lightning. No, 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 they don't. Why did I write the Ghostbusters? That's Dana and Tully. <laughs> My notes are wrong. Don't trust them. Well, no, uh, no, no, because they, they encounter uh, is Go- Gozo. Gozo. Go- Gozo. Gozo, yeah. Gonzo? Goza. Goza the Gozarian. Goza, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the right. Traveller, yeah. the Destructor. It purple lightnings them, that's for sure. But first, uh, yeah, the purple lightning, it, it hits Dana and Tully. They turn into a dog, and <laughs> Bill Murray goes, okay, so she's a dog. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. this, is great. this relationship is taking a turn. <laughs> and Lewis Tully goes, well, I nearly fucked a horse. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. he's like, yeah, look, it could be worse. <laughs> mm. I think I figured out our catchphrase for this whole podcast. Maybe that was wrong, Jeremy. I think that's it. <laughs> Goza is great, though. She's basically just a pop singer. <laughs> it looks yeah, really good. it's Lady Gaga. <laughs> 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 the, the demigod. <laughs> Yeah. A little bit of Bowie. Wait, what do you mean? Lady Gaga is a demigod. Yeah, yeah, no, that would make sense. Look, honestly, if if it was released, oh, Lady Gaga had a cult and she was actually a demigod, demonic <laughs> creature from another plane, I'd be like, ah, oh, that makes so much sense. <laughs> that explains all the meat. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah. I, I like uh, Dan Aykroyd. He goes up to try and negotiate with her and she's like, are you a god? No, he replies with, and then she's like, "Then die," and then like straight after that, Ray, when you if you <laughs> if you if somebody asks you if you're a god, you say yes. Yeah, and then Bill says, "All right, this chick is toast." <laughs> she does the uh, the emperor in episode three flip. She flips in mid air, <laughs> <laughs> lands behind them. Uh, yeah. And they neutralize, neutralized her. And that's the end of the film. They get her and it's not yet. Yeah. And, and then Bill Murray marries Dana, who's still a dog. It's great. Yeah. And we don't want to know the implications of that. <laughs> and they don't let us know. They, it, it sort of fades to black. And it's just a, bit, <laughs> a voiceover tells them to choose the form of their destructor, which is quite nice, actually. Isn't that nice? Mm. Yeah. I, th- I think it's, y- you know, she's going to wreck him anyway might as well let them choose who they're mm. gonna get destroyed with you know it doesn't really matter to her yeah that, that, that's that's a very you're right that is a very nice thing yeah for uh goza to to let him choose and of course everyone is like oh i get it or she wants us to think of anything and that'll be our distress so just everyone mm. d- don't think of anything and everybody everybody clears their minds and nobody thinks of anything my favorite thing in that like he says empty your heads don't think of anything and you look at Ernie Hudson and he actually shows you what it is to he does an acting thing where he like hits the head it hits his head with his hand and shakes it and goes oh <laughs> right so that's how you think about nothing <laughs> I'm like, that's a good yeah, acting yeah. choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. Some people just think um, you just have to think, you know, just use your mind. No, no, no. It's a, it's an actual physical action you need to do. Yeah, you have to hit your head. <laughs> yeah, clearly. Yeah, of course. And we get what is still, I think, my 
favorite reveal in cinema ever because it's so <laughs> ridiculous but it's so good it's really is it's dumb. the stay puffed marshmallow man walking through but i've got to ask what would you pick the destructor of earth to be uh, Rob, mm. or Zach. Oh gosh, that's a good one. If someone told me to clear my mind and not think of anything that could destroy this world, well, there's something. Whenever says someone says think of something random, I always think of turkeys. <laughs> well, then. I don't know why, but turkeys <laughs> is my go-to random object. Nice. I'm not sure it's my perfect choice, but I can't get out of my head the image of you mm. know uh, of this you know failed TV star narcissist billionaire taking you know with orange skin and a bad comb over just seems to oh, keep on nice. coming into my head as being the the source of the destruction oh, of of no. society. So it yeah. It's not my first choice, but I just can't stop thinking about this as the destruction of everything we hold dear. Oh, yeah, nice. God. Just a giant <laughs> wig flies off his head <laughs> as he's crunching through the city. Yeah, turkey, turkey, a giant turkey. It giant would make turkey. a great dinner. What about you, Sandro? To stick with product placement, probably a bottle of VB. <laughs> just mm. walking around the city. Mm. Oh, no. <laughs> How's it going, <laughs> fellas? <laughs> oh, and then when they blow it up, and you know the guy get the dick get dickless boy over here gets mm. splashed with goop, it can just be VB. Oh, uh, yeah. my ones he gets squashed by a giant drumstick, <laughs> and um, he gets crushed by a giant wig. Yeah, in one. The, yeah the biggest mm. toupee uh, in no in, in the world. Yeah, mm. yeah. We got a handful of great quotes. here here we got i'm terrified beyond the capacity of actual thought from egon excellent yeah. stuff uh i forget who says this but someone calls it a mother pus bucket that is uh that is that that is bill murray yeah mother pus bucket uh-huh. and pete vakeman has the great line where he goes we're looking at this all wrong mr stapoff he's a sailor he's in new york if we get this guy laid we'll have no trouble <laughs> oh yeah that was good egon's like all right we gotta cross the stream now hold up a second wasn't there one thing we weren't supposed to do? <laughs> now hold, hold the phone. There was one thing you told us not to do. You said crossing yeah. the streams was bad. Yeah. Um, and that was a bad one. But it does lead up to that heroic moment where they all, you know, realize they've got to mm. sacrifice themselves. And it's got the line that I've used multiple times as my sign-off call whenever I've been on, uh, run my own shows on, on community television, stuff like that. Yeah, where he goes, see on the other side, Ray. Love it. Oh, yeah. Mm. I also like, uh, you're going to endanger <laughs> endanger our client, the nice lady who paid us in advance before turning into a dog. <laughs> it's so it's a fucking great line. Before she yeah. became a dog. You're going to endanger us. You're going to endanger our client, a nice lady who paid us in advance before she became a dog. Great line. Yeah. So, yeah. It's very much a line that would come out of like an improv scene. Some of the best moments in improv when you've created all these amazing moments and then there's a part where you reflect on it at the end going, right, so what's happened here is this is a nice woman who's paid this in advance but then she's turned into a dog. And then improv scene, you go, <laughs> yeah, all right, okay, that's reality. And so it's kind of yeah. that moment in an improv show where you just go, can we just reflect on what we have created here and everyone's on the same page? Okay, mm-hmm. cool. And then, yeah, they cross streams, it all explodes, Marshmallow falls on the people below. It's all epic, it's brilliant. Like- you like, but are the Ghostbusters dead? Did they sacrifice themselves? And no, they're still alive and they're covered in marshmallow, aside from Murray. <laughs> Probably contract thing. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. No, he was just lucky, you know? Yeah. Was- <laughs> yeah. Sigourney and Moranis, they are rescued from being inside of the gargoyles. It ends on, I love this town. Great line, great final moment. <laughs> yeah. The energy's brilliant. That one's actually by Winston. <laughs> that one is the one Winston line. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, it ends with Slimer being free. <laughs> yeah, yeah they're, they all go down. Everybody's celebrating them. They, they drive off and then Slimer... Wah! Right at the camera. It's a great way to finish it where you see what happens after. Like how it's, you, they're all talking and they're, like, they're putting on their, putting their, their packs back into the car and you've got, you know, them taking photos and, and Lewis Tully getting taken away. He's like, I want to go with those guys. Anybody want to interview me? Yeah, yeah. It just shows that the reality carries on even though the film's over. It's a, it's, it's a really good choice. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I did have one thing. The credits... It's like a verse and a chorus of the three songs they used in the film. Yeah. It just kind of replays what you've already heard, which I don't mind, but I kind of would have preferred maybe a longer 
song, just mm. one long. I don't know. It's an mm. interesting kind of soundtrack choice. Yeah, it's, I, it's yeah. like the greatest hits of everything that's gone before. But anyway, that is Ghostbusters. Uh, obviously, this is one of the best films we've ever done on the show, and it's one of my favorites of all time. It's one of Rob's favorites of all time as well. I'm oh yeah, it's my least favorite of all time. <laughs> oh, I hate no. this goddamn. It's no, it's no Flintstones. <laughs> it's no Flintstones. <laughs> nah, it's great. I love this movie. Yeah, I think this is hundred percent better than a goodie, which means. Mm. What are we calling films that are better than a goodie this year? A ghost job. It's a ghost job. It's a ghost job for me. The ghost job award. It's a masterpiece for me. Masterpiece. Mm. Well, last year we called films that were better than a goodie. We gave them the Dead Dad Award based off Lion King. Oh, mm. okay. Because all good movies must have a dead father figure. We had Pulp Fiction, which of course has a dead dad. We got uh, Forrest Gump, which has a potential dead dad. And then of course... Absent uh, dad, which is practically dead. And then uh, Shawshank was the other one that got it. Had a potential dad because there was the guy that his wife cheated on him with, which they could have had a baby eventually, yeah. but he shot the, someone else shot yeah. them, which he got blamed for. So he could have been a dad, but then he died. I like exactly. how the I like how the connection started really strong, and now it's getting looser and looser with yeah, each film. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it gets weaker. Trust. <laughs> they were the four films that got the Dead Dad Award for 1994. Well, do mm. we do we do we start a new one? I think we should start a new one. Yeah, that's why I'm saying Ghost Job. The only thing we've got is Ghost Job. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the ghost jobby award the ghost jobby award banging a horse banging That's a horse award one. where's <laughs> ron jeremy award? where's ron jeremy award <laughs> banging a horse or the ghost jobby i like where's ron jeremy <laughs> <laughs> that one's hard to remember because in every film we could just say where is he where's ron <laughs> where's yeah. i can't find him in this film we <laughs> can't find him somewhere. at all so yeah and if you find something that is better than a goodie it should not have Ron Jeremy anywhere near it. <laughs> or yeah. at least yeah, very, exactly. very hard to find. If he's, if, he, if we can't find him in it, must be a good film. It must be a good right. film. It's at least got more to it than that. <laughs> so worse than an oldie this year is Cracked, more like just plain broken, and better <laughs> than a goodie is Where is Ron Jeremy? <laughs> <laughs> yes. We Love did it. it. Love it. That's Woo. it. All right, let's move on to sequels. There are, of course, sequels of this movie from 19... 19- mm. 86 to 1991, The Real Ghostbusters was on TV, was an animated show, did very well, got some uh, monthly comics out there as well, which were running. 1982, Ghostbusters 2, cost a little more, made a little less, pretty negative reviews from the critics on release, audiences didn't hate it. I think it got like an A- on the cinema score or something, so you know, it's not It's pretty good, it's pretty good. I liked how it had just the plot of that one old sci-fi one where it's just the blob ooze, (laughs) pink ooze that's just eating people. 1997 was Extreme Ghostbusters, which we won't talk about, but then in 2009 there was Ghostbusters the video game. Written yes. by Ackroyd and Ramus, voiced by the original team. You plays a character called the Rookie. The game is basically Ghostbusters three. It's phenomenal. It's yeah. so good. Yeah, I've got, I've got it on the on the Wii. Oh, that'd be great on the Wii because you could point the laser. Yeah, oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then of course there was uh, the one in 2016, Ghostbusters: Answer the Call, which we we will say nothing about because our comment section will light up. <laughs> it's not the worst. It's just. It yeah. Mm. It's not. It, it's, I liked it when it came out, but yeah. Look, I I I have it on Blu-ray, but I haven't watched it since I saw it in the cinemas. Look, um, Kate McKinnon is the breakthrough in it. Uh, Leslie Jones is really good in it as well. Uh, Kristen Wiig isn't in top form. Uh, it's great to see mm. um, Melissa McCarthy doing something where she's not reliant on her aggressive, vulgar swearing. Yeah. Um, so Definitely. I actually mm. quite like that. It's it's a bit of a mess. The cameos from the lead from the old cast are pretty bad. Bill Murray's not that good. Mm. Danny. Dan Aykroyd's a bit cringeworthy. Yeah, well, didn't they get, like, forced into doing it? Or, like, Bill yep. Murray was forced into yeah, it was making a, it? Yeah, it was a... Um, he had to... It was, like, a contract thing, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but um, but uh, Ernie Hudson's really good in it. His little cameo is really, really cute. I think the main thing with that is they didn't make it a part of the established universe, which they really should have. I think that made it kind of... Yeah, mm. I think they should have as well. And there's also a case of the comedy stylings were a bit different. The whole... Uh, 84 yeah. film was about a tightly written script and with mm. with room to improvise and but the script was still there what they did a lot of which a lot of cinema still does now comedy cinema does now like the 
uh, anchor man effect is just let the camera roll and just go off on riffs and then we'll edit something together from many different takes and it just didn't gel because none of them hit as hard there was just iconic lines in the 1984 film that are well written well constructed and tightly wound with a lot of little mm. bits of moments of sparks of improvisation whereas this whole film is based on going off on riffs and so there's no solid skeleton there to keep it together which is a shame because they are incredible cast yeah. and talented cast of uh, mm-hmm. comedians and it's a, a and Paul Figge is a, a great director he's done some incredible stuff so I just yeah. I think he's a bit overwhelmed with uh, the subject matter and the budget that he had it's like his biggest film he's ever worked on and he'd never done something of a blockbuster size and it kind of shows I, I yeah I, I hate to drag the segment on even more but like yeah I definitely feel like if they could have just been like Hey, we're big fans of the Ghostbusters. Oh, we find the Ghostbusters suits in an old dirty closet or whatever, you know? And then we we have to bust the ghost because we're the only people who actually know how to use these things because we're such big fans or whatever. Yeah, you know? it's, it's really tricky to, you know how do you tip the hat to nostalgia without being indulgent in it because there is a danger of, of being mm. too caught up in that. But also the decision of Figgy and, and, and Columbia and whoever produced it uh, to go, no, let's have nothing, no ties to it at all. Let's completely, that really distanced a lot of people from it. And, and so the audience didn't really have anything to tie on, tie to it because they didn't have that same investment in it. Everyone in some way, shape or form knows Ghostbusters because it was such a cultural mm. phenomenon. So even whether you're a big fan or not, you have an element to it. So to completely cut that off, not only cut off the hardcore fans who were appalling, the way that Paul Figgy and the cast were treated was appalling by fans. Oh, awful. Yeah. Absolutely awful. Yeah. But also mainstream audiences go, well, if you're not tying it to what vaguely we remember, we're not invested in this. And they didn't. So it didn't do that well in the box office. No. Nobody really liked only about it. 200, only about 200 mm. million, which based off a $100 million budget plus marketing, a complete bomb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a shame. Also, in 2016, there was a TV show announced called Ghostbusters Ecto Force. Uh, Ivan Reitman was, I think, r- producing? He had a lot of involvement in it. It was meant to be set in, like, the year 2050 or something, some sort of futuristic ghost busting stuff but th- that show was uh was postponed because he's now working on an animated ghostbusters film for sony uh which is still in development no idea when that's going to come out and then yeah th- this year we were meant to see ghostbusters afterlife a proper sequel incredible trailer such a beautiful trailer yeah. also directed by ivan reitman's son which is really nice to see him there Justin reitman who's done great films like he did um uh, up in the air and he did juno so um uh, thank you for smoking mm. oh incredible director yeah, Paul so Rudd's in there. Um, uh, Finn Wolf Hart is there. So when that does eventually come out next year, March next year is its current release date. I'm excited for it. I, I hope it does well. So yeah, uh, but with all that said, we've got to quickly pitch our own sequel or spin-off or prequel mm. or midquel or um, training montage. <laughs> Let's start off with Zach. What have you got? Okay, so... This is, uh, like, two or three years after Ghostbusters has happened. Uh, all the all the spectres and other things have sort of calmed down. You know, the, the aftermath of the events were really spectacular, you know. But eventually, they round out most of the ghosts. Um, so most of them sort of, like, drift apart. They, they finish up with the ghostbusting business and all that. But that all changes... When, um, uh, I'm going to say Ghost Hitler (laughs) (laughs) comes around and gets his own ghost army of evildoers, uh, throughout history. Ah. Just like, uh, Darius, I don't know, other evil, evil historic figures all grouped together (laughs) to try and take over the world. And of course, modern military weapons, they can't do anything against ghosts. No. The the ghosts just start taking over. Um so the military uh get the Ghostbusters team back together and help them fix up everybody with a uh, new ghost fighting technology. Uh and there's there's training montages of the Ghostbusters training recruits <laughs> oh, to use uh, the, the the technology to to fight ghosts. 
Uh, it's 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 World War Three ghost busting. Oh my god! <laughs> or something like that. Sounds like an episode of South Park or Rick and Morty. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that, that's my movie uh, pitch. What have you got, Rob? <laughs> wow, uh, I've just got a uh, I've got whiplash from hearing that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're welcome from that. One. <laughs> um, after Ghostbusters two, I always thought it'd be great to see what happened to Oscar, um, Dana Barrett's little mm. uh, baby. Um, so. So Oscar's about, you know, 30 now, so about our time. And so I want to use elements of the original Ghostbusters as well, um, where the original Ghostbusters idea of Dan Aykroyd was them, like, cross-dimensional, like, epic adventures of hunting for ghosts across dimensions. So I see this as a mixture yeah. of mm. uh, Ghostbusters, a bit of sliders. Um, uh, so uh, Oscar gets all the uh, equipment, and he's, he's haunted by the ghost of Vigo. So he um, has to go get it sorted out, and the old, you know, goes see... Uh, Ray and finds out what it all is. He's got these memories, but Dana doesn't want him to know about it because he wants him to live a happy life and finds out, you know, that his destiny is to be a part of the Ghostbusters. So he starts a new, Whoa, a new branch, that's cool. new branch of Ghostbusters to, you know, there's this interdimensional ghost trying to break into our dimension. So they have to, you know, with the help of uh, Egon's uh, daughter has to sort of like use this new technology to, to break into other dimensions and stop the ghosts from coming through. So he piles a crew of people uh, adjacent or connected uh, relationship wise to the old Ghostbusters, a mixture of boys and girls and all multicultural representations there, you know, really bring it all in. And they go from dimension to dimension to stop these uh, ghosts breaking in and destroying our dimension. So the interdimensional Ghostbusters, mm. I think that could be cool. That That's cool. cool. I like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, and Ghost Hitler's there. Oh, absolutely. We don't know where. Yeah. Where's Ghost Hitler? He's played by Ron Jeremy. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> absolutely. Yep. Oh. And what about you, Sandro? Um, so I want it to start off as like a normal adventure. We got the 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 four guys, they're out doing their thing, they're busting some ghosts, but then out of nowhere, uh, let's say a giant portal opens up. Ray, Egon, Whoa. Peter, they get taken to some world somewhere no one knows where they are some ghosts have captured them in their dimension and winston he goes back to the the base he lets everyone know and winston janey lewis tully dana barrett they have to team up to try and save them it's ghostbusters b team (laughs) love it um mainly i just want winston to kind of be the mentor to these guys and give tully something more to do uh, give Janie something more to do as well. She might put on the suit. That could be fun. She did put the suit on in uh, the real Ghostbusters uh, in some of the comic book sends off. Oh, really? And yeah, she became an actual. She became an actual Ghostbuster in some of the comic books. Oh, nice. Yeah. So um, yeah, just have that in like a live action form. Ghostbusters B team, or maybe West Coast Ghostbusters. <laughs> oh no! Adventures with it. They move over to the West Coast or something. And Ron Jeremy's in it playing Hitler, of course. Of yes, course, of uh, course, of course. Of course. West Side Ghost Hitler. Yeah, he's surfing, you know. Let's move on to. Reviewing <laughs> reviews. <laughs> wow. Yeah, amazing. This is the part of the show where uh, I get up reviews from the unbiased critics, which would be the audience reviews, because critics, they're biased. They're paid off. Wow. They're corporate shills. I feel attacked. I don't know about you, Rob. I feel pretty attacked at the moment. <laughs> um, and uh, so we're getting the audience reviews, and I'm going to read out the uh, reviews. And these two lovely gentlemen are going to guess what they rated them out of five. There are point fives. So you could go like a 3.5, 2.5, whatever. So just keep that in mind as you're guessing some of these things. Mm-hmm. Starting out with Joshua. Joshua says, Ghostbusters is a stylish, ghost-filled comedy with an extremely charismatic cast. Mm. A+. Plus. Oh, that sounds like a 5 out of 5. Mm. Yeah, I go four and a half. It's a four and a half. Well done. Wow. Rob gets a point. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's get, so, so so what gets a five? A <laughs> plus is four and a half. A what plus get- plus, you idiot. <laughs> uh, obviously. Or an S. Right. Alright. Um, or an S. <laughs> yeah. Or the entire alphabet. The entire yeah. alphabet that gets five and five. Absolutely. Alright. Wow. Should should have thought about that one, you idiot. I mean Rob is the teacher, so <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's the professional when it comes to his ratings. What yeah. would you rate it if it was a five out of five? Um, I'd give it uh, a plus plus. 
Yeah, there you go. See? Yeah. Told you. Yeah. Professional. There we go. See, this is why you got the point and Sanjay didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, he also got the point because he guessed it correctly. <laughs> uh, I think yeah. that may have also been. Uh, Josh says, uh, can't go wrong with Ghostbusters! Explanation mark. Uh, I'm going to go for a four. Yeah, I'll go okay. uh, uh, 3.5. 3.5. Once again, Rob gets it with <laughs> a 3.5. <laughs> I thought I thought you guys would be a bit more, uh, you know, optimistic with can't go wrong with Ghostbusters, but uh, wow, no, at three point five, can't go wrong with Ghostbusters is pretty positive, but it's non-committal. So it's going, oh, you can't go wrong with that. Mm. So it seems like yeah, yeah, yeah you picked up on that very well. That's wow, true. that's two. That was the margarita pizza of reviews. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're perfect. right. You're very right. All right, Kevin says. Bill Murray is the man. Of course, Bill would say that. Explanation mark. Explanation mark. Explanation mark. Those exclam those exclamation marks make me think that uh, this is a four point five for me. Yeah, I think it's a four. You think it's a four? It's actually a four point five. This hey, time. Sandra gets well the done, point. Sandra. Well done. First time for everything, I guess. <laughs> Darius, he says, Bill Murray, Bill Murray, Bill Murray. <laughs> Explanation mark, explanation mark, explanation mark. These are great reviews. These are real. <laughs> did you really like good. did you like Bill Murray is the man followed up by Bill Murray, Bill Murray, <laughs> Bill Murray? Yeah, someone just couldn't contain it to one Bill Murray. They needed to yeah. mention him three times. Like do the candy yeah. man thing. I'm gonna go three point five. Well, because he made it three times, it's gotta be about four point five or five, so I'll go with four point five. It's actually four. Oh four. You, you were close. Yeah, yeah. He did put it as a a, a four. John says, I went expecting to see a funny movie, dot, dot, dot. Wow. I say it's a two. You say it's a two? What are you thinking, Sandra? Two. I'm actually going to go a one, I think. You're going to go a one? Oh, you were very close. It was a 0.5. Oh, wow. I rated it the lowest wow. possible. Shingo has an in-depth review with title, Ghostbuster. Story writing message plot, four. Character acting, four. Music slash sound, four. Cinematography slash editing, three. Age mm. slash originality, three. Total, 18 out of 25. Okay. D yep. Uh, 3.5 out of 5 for me. All right. That's yeah, 5. that's a four out of five for me. Oh, it's actually a 3.5. Sandra's on the math today. Yeah, well done. I think, Rob, you'll get this one. Jean, she's on your level. Great Dan Aykroyd film, ages eight plus. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, already she's uh, she's saying you you watched it way too early. <laughs> it's eight plus, so you watched it at seven. That's a no no. Yeah, yeah. No wonder you got so scared. Um, four? Yeah, I'll go four. I'll go four as well. <laughs> oh, you both go four. It is four. Well yeah. done. Yeah. I don't know how you guys got that one. That was amazing. Um, but yeah, thanks for telling us it's eight plus. <laughs> That's great. We got out of that with Temple of Doom as well. Someone was like twelve plus. Cameron says funny, smart, but it is silly. Four out of five stars. <laughs> <laughs> five out of five. You're ready to get five out of five? Okay. I get a four out of five. It's a four out of five. She said it in the review. <laughs> it's in the fucking review. <laughs> to be fair, there was a review <laughs> one time where it said like four out of five and then had five out of five. Oh my God. That's fair. Oh dear, Rotten Tomatoes. And then finally, Chris says, take it or leave it. 2.5, I guess. Right okay. down the middle. 1.5. It's 2.5. It's hey. right down the middle. Well, well done. done. Wow, we well, end on a tie. Four oh, points each. How about that? A tie. There you go. Well, I could get a tiebreaker question uh, real quick if you would like. Nah, I think this episode has gone on. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair enough. <laughs> All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our episode on Ghostbusters. This was a long one, but of course it was uh, because mm. we're in blockbuster season and it's the 80s and it's great. Uh, thank you for joining us, Rob. Oh, pleasure. Always a pleasure to chat movies with you and I uh, hope to do it again very soon. Ooh, foreshadowing. Uh, <laughs> um, as always, you can catch you can catch Rob, myself, our guest from last week, Reese, as well, over on the Nerd Out channel. Uh, mm. Nerd Out with Rob Lloyd, Jen Spears, Sanja Felcher. Always fun. We've been doing pretty regular episodes. I don't know what we would talk about this week because we record this show in advance and we don't record Nerd Out in advance. So who knows? <laughs> but it's mm. always a fun show. 
We will try and get Zach. It's a little harder because we are recording on Skype, so we can't really get guests on mm. the main Nerd Out show because editing four channels would be hell. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but when we're back, maybe in person, we'll get Zach on. It'll be fun. Definitely. Absolutely. Um, do you have anything else you want to plug? Any socials or any projects or TV shows that are currently airing? Oh, yeah. If you get a chance, watch uh, Middle Ditch and Schwartz, a uh, great long-form improv on uh, Netflix. Um, also, if you've got Disney+, Plus, watch Encore. Great show about uh, old high school productions reuniting and uh, for one night only remounting uh, that production. Um, and uh, gosh, what else? Uh, um, yeah, uh, Sandra and I are deep in the bowels of watching uh, Twin Peaks for the first time. So looking forward Ooh. to talking about that Ooh, soon. Yeah. Uh, you can email the show if you want, oldiebuttygoodiepod at gmail.com. Let us know what you think of movies. Let us know what you want us to review. Let us know anything. Uh, we've got socials. We're on Facebook. You can message us there. We are on, well, I'm on Instagram. Uh, Zach is as well. You can follow him. If he gets uh, 100 followers over the next uh, week, he will post Actually something. Actually use it. Yes. <laughs> uh, all the links to everything in the description, Zach, you are picking next week's episode. What are my choices? Tell me all about them. I want to hear them. I want to know what we're doing. One thing came out next week. Oh. <laughs> Under the Volcano. It's a popular award-winning film set in a small Mexican town during the Day of the Dead in the 30s. Ooh. Okay. Um, Wait, if only one thing came out, does that mean rules apply that I could use to perhaps to go back and visit a, a previous movie? Yep, you can pick any of the alternate options from this week. Gremlins! <laughs> Woohoo! Woo! Gremlins? Gremlins! You toss them in the bathtub, you feed them after midnight, you just throw them around, everything's going out of order, it's fantastic. Hey, Rob. Hey, Sandro. Do you like Gremlins? You know what? I really do. I love that film very, very much. Hmm. What are you doing next week? Um, I'm completely free on my uh, day of n- not recording. <laughs> mm. You want to do Gremlins? Yeah. Oh, what a great, yeah. what a great not planned at all uh, invitation. R- Rob's joining us next week for Gremlins. It's going to be a fun Woo! time. Let's Excellent. wrap it up with a favourite quote from Ghostbusters. I've got to find one. Uh, I want to start with Rob's. I want to hear oh. his because he's a he he's he can read the script out of his <laughs> mind. He's got it all <laughs> downloaded in there. He could reenact the entire movie uh, back to back. I feel at this point. So I want to hear his favourite quote. Well, I've probably mm-hmm. done many quotes. I'll try and pick a quote that I mm. haven't done yet. Uh, one that I yeah, haven't yeah, done that's yet. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep, yep, yep. Go into the database. Hacking in. Uh, okay. 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 Early on in the film, it's a line I particularly like. Egon, this reminds me of the time you tried to drill a hole through your head. That would have worked if you hadn't stopped me. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's great. My favorite would be, uh, we came, we saw, we kissed. Oh, I messed it up. (laughs) Messed it up again. Yeah, that was my favorite quote. And uh, my one is obviously, yeah, of course. Yeah, this man over here, he has no dick, man. Look at that guy. He has no dick, this man. It's true, he has no dick. Anyway, come eat my pepperoni pizza. Hey. Come eat my pepperoni pizza. It at least has a dick. I mean, uh, it doesn't... No dick. 